This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. Welcome to the human side of healthcare. Delighted you're with us today. And you know, Thomas, I want to talk a little bit about just viruses in general, not just COVID. Let's bring John Carlo back and talk to him. Dr. Carlo sure helped get us through COVID. And now that we're into this phase, we've learned something from COVID that can keep us healthy and well all year long. That's what we're going to talk about. So we're delighted we've got Dr. John Carlo, who's president and CEO, Prism Health North Texas, and does extensive work with the Texas Medical Association. Welcome back, Dr. Carlo. Hey, thanks, Steve Thomas, for having me again. You know, we're hearing that nationwide COVID cases and hospitalizations are going up. Thankfully, here in North Texas, hospitalizations are relatively flat. Do you think we still might have a summer surge? Well, I think, you know, that's the question everybody wants the answer to. And and unfortunately, I don't think anybody can predict Uh, with certainty, what is going to happen next? Um, Taking apart a couple of things that might give us concern, number one, this has happened before. So we've had, unfortunately, surges uh, in the summertime, as as you know, and and so we have seen COVID return uh, after a period of of relative absence. Um, So number one, it's proven itself to do this, so that would lend itself to be highly possible. Um, the second thing that is is concerning is uh, we're starting to see other areas around the world. Today, there's some notes from South Africa that there might be a, yet another subvariant um, and new cases over there and, and other places such as China are experiencing great increases. Um, and we've learned also that what happens elsewhere very quickly comes our way. There's no way to simply avoid what what does happen somewhere else as it won't come to us. So, you know, those two things alone give us caution, I think. The one sort of positive, I guess, is that we've had so many folks in Texas that have had the vaccine or have had an infection. Uh, We we may be relatively immune, but uh, what this gives us and for how long, I I, I don't know the answer to. You know, in other parts of the world, The virus is really growing, and there are even lockdowns like China. That impacts the supply chain, and it hurts our economy. Would you agree? It is worrisome. I, I think, especially in the in in the medical field, especially, we've learned just how much interdependencies around the the world uh, there is for making critical medical equipment, supplies, drugs, pharmaceuticals, you know, you name it. It it is almost unique to have things only made here in the United States, unfortunately, these days. So, yeah, we cannot just deny that if something else happens somewhere else, it's likely to affect uh, us in ways that perhaps we hadn't anticipated. You make some good points, and hopefully we're going to have a spike, not a surge, if we do have an increase. Going to pivot a little bit now. Memorial Day's coming up, summer travel. Do you have any nuggets of knowledge to share with people that are going to travel? Well, you know, it's interesting, as, as you were talking about this when we opened up today's conversation, the first thing I was thinking about is, you know, the how much the world has changed. And one of the things I still find very interesting is the myth, if you will, that if you uh, if it's cold in the wintertime and you fail, if you forget your coat or your jacket, uh, your mother might have said, uh, don't forget your coat or you'll catch a cold. And we know there's no there's no truth to that. There's simply no science that would support uh, that. But we still have a belief that I think many believe that that is to be the case. But the opposite of that, the opposite of myth is what we do know and what the science has told us. And that is that the mask use has proven to be very effective. And I have to admit, I in, in the converted one as well, because before COVID, the infection control and the world around what we knew with viruses really didn't point to uh, individual mask use as being very effective at all. It was only through the last two years of this experience that we've learned this valuable information. Um, but really, 
there is no question that wearing a mask really does its job in preventing COVID and also all the other respiratory pathogens that are out there on this planet that we really don't want to have at any one time. So what about wiping down surfaces? Is that still important? Well, I'll tell you the, uh, the, the overall science of, of kind of how you can protect yourself for COVID, that does not look like to be uh, a big issue. As you might have remembered early on in the COVID pandemic, we were really worried about what we call fomite transmission or basically contact transmission, which really just has not played itself out as being a significant way of transmission. But overall, there are many other things that, that can be, you know, a risk around contact transmission. And so, you know, I, I look at everything kind of holistically. The big thing, if you're going to touch things like that, is, is not necessarily what you're going to do with the objects themselves, but also what you're going to do with your hands. Uh, and, you know, frequent hand washing is one of those things that we always point to as being extremely effective. I mean, it's, as we know in healthcare, it's a requirement for healthcare workers to have good hand washing hygiene. And really, I think that works for everybody in most of the scenarios where we're going to be in and around our environments. Great advice. Strategically wearing your mask when you travel, washing your hands. Overall, would you say we're in a pretty good place? You know, I think it is. We are in a good place at the very moment. I, I'm, I think I share everybody's enthusiasm and interest to, to finally have some fun and get out and experience the world. Um, I think we're cautiously optimistic. I think that the biggest advice I would say going into this is particularly around airline travel. Even though the mask is no longer required, that does not mean you can't do it. And I certainly think that wearing a mask particularly in the airports and getting onto the plane itself just makes a lot of sense. If you think about how many people, especially during the holidays, you know, those busy airports, the terminals, the, the waiting areas, you just you are in contact with so many people. And I just think that that's a, a great opportunity to have a defense and one that doesn't really cost much of anything overall uh, in ensuring that you can have a, a safe and healthy trip. And just in a quick parting comment, how could we view the mask without the stigma positively in our society in the future? Maybe the option of wearing a mask can be considered a freedom of choice and one that is highly respected rather than, you know, criticized. So maybe we'll get there as we slowly unwind the quote unquote mandates and our short attention span moves beyond that. And we realize that this is the right thing to do because science is telling us. That's what I hope. I love that. So in other words, I love you. I love being here. I just don't want whatever you have. (laughs) <laughs> that's it right <laughs> it, it really is i mean it's it's interesting the level we we sort of take for granted i i do think that it is interesting that the handshake has has changed i don't know if you all have noticed this but i certainly noticed that the handshakes are fewer and fewer and it is the effect of what we've been through together dr john carlo thanks for stopping back by with an update and on how we can all stay well all year long Next, we're going to shift to our kids, tell you about a new podcast out from Cook Children's that's going to help kids and their families next on the human side of healthcare. This is the human side of healthcare, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. Welcome back. You know, Thomas, this is the human side of healthcare, and we don't want to be dark and down, but We'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the loss of a great country music singer to suicide recently. And this is a problem not only with adults, but with our children and adolescents. And we want to focus on the positive of how we can listen and help them as they struggle with behavioral health issues. And, you know, Cook Children's Hospital in Fort Worth is starting a new podcast to help get this message out, not only to the children, adolescent, but their parents on things we can do to improve our mental health. We are delighted we've got Winnie King, the Chief of Communications 
for inclusion, diversity, and equity at Cook Children's Healthcare System, along with Dr. Kristen Perch, who's the co-medical director of psychiatry at Cook Children's Healthcare System. We want to welcome both of you to the show. Thank you so much for having us and bringing awareness about this very important topic. Yes, thank you so much. It is very important. Thank you. We know the mental health of our children, of our adolescents, is so important. So I'm just going to, for our listeners' sake, Why did Cook Children's decide to start this journey of the Raising Joy podcast? This is Winnie King, and I think you mentioned it in the beginning in your intro. It had a lot to do with the way we saw the trend going up, the numbers going up of attempted suicides and some who had uh, actually completed suicide. It, It was alarming at the very beginning of the pandemic, and the numbers never stopped really going up. Um, and, and that was concerning to us. And it really sounded an alarm that we needed to do something. We needed to take uh, a look at what, what was going on with these children and why did they feel that they needed to do this and why, why was this there out? Um, it was really alarming, and, and we just really needed to do something. Can you expand a little bit on how the pandemic truly has impacted the overall mental health of our children. And this is Dr. Perch. Um, I would say that the pandemic has, for the most part, had a pretty negative impact on the mental health of kids and teens. And, you know, I think whenever the pandemic first started, it was very hard on them because kids and teenagers are very social individuals. And, you know, whenever you have that added anxiety about, you know, when I'm social, am I also getting COVID or am I passing it on to someone else? A lot of those interactions were really uh, curtailed. And so I think that that is where uh, the negative impact started. And then, you know, you have to think about the loss of extracurricular activities and all the fun parts of school that really help, you know, build a kid's self-esteem. And um, I just think that between that virtual school And, um, you know, just not being able to see your friends as much, it just over time has really worn on kids' mental health. You know, Dr. Perch, that's some really insightful information you gave us. And I want to ask you something. Even in the pandemic, when kids weren't seeing their friends, I'm assuming with virtual, social media, et cetera, bullying continued. Have you noticed that in any of the cases you've treated? Absolutely. Bullying is a huge impactor um, of kids' mental health, you know, if they are the recipient of bullying. And like you were saying, because so much more of their lives are virtual, you know, whether that be through social media, it, it takes so much less courage to type out a negative comment than to actually say something to someone's face. And I think because of that, more kids are being bullied, more are being targeted, and that does have a negative effect on kids' self-esteem and their mental health, for sure. You know, you raised such a good point. You know, I remember when I was in school, and the bully was in the schoolyard, and it would be like 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and that's it. Children today are exposed to bullying 24-7. I can only imagine the pressure it puts kids under. Would you agree? I do agree. And I think that's why it's important for parents to help their kids unplug from electronics and to have other things that they enjoy and that make them feel good about themselves and to keep those in-person interactions because it's very easy to just stay online. Um, And and teenagers will do that um, as long as you let them. But I think it's really important to get them outside, get them fresh air, um, see their friends in real life. And um, I think that that's so important. You know, the Raising Joy podcast sounds so exciting. Well, what topics do you plan to cover? We're going to look at a myriad of topics. Um, Anything that deals in anxiety, um, stress, depression, trauma, anything that um, has impacted a child and, and their parents so that parents understand what it is that they can possibly do um, where they can go, the the kinds of uh, assistance that they can uh, render if they find that their child is in um, 
in distress. Um, it, it's going to be something that uh, parents will be able to look, listen to and understand that there's help on the way and you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do it by yourself. And we've got a, a myriad of experts who can come to the table and give good advice, great tips um, to help them see if they can navigate through the situation with their kids. And I'm learning so much in just having these conversations with our experts. You know, I feel like every podcast that we do, I learn something new as either a psychiatrist or as a parent. And so I know that it will be really helpful for, you know, people in our community just raising awareness about all these, you know, concerns that we have about teenagers. You know, when you think in terms of mental health, and we all certainly agree that your overall health is not just physical health, it's mental health. Why do you think it's important to devote time and energy explaining and discussing mental health in children. Stigma is a big deal. And um, one of the things that we've learned through the podcast is that um, when, when kids are in a circle, for instance, um, and they're working out their issues, uh, particularly if they're in a hospital setting and, they've, and, and it's gotten to that point, um, when they find out and they start talking around each other, they realize that they're not alone and they realize that there are other people who have the same kinds of issues. And when you realize that you're not alone, it really does make this uh, a whole lot easier, a whole lot better. And not only for the kids, but for the parents. Um, there's always that stigma too with the parents who say, there's something wrong with my child and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, and, and that reflects on me as a parent. And one of the things that I've I've always wanted for us to, to reflect on when we're doing the, the podcast is that parents honestly need to give themselves a little grace. Um, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be um, the parent with the most. Um, we're all human. We all have fallacies. We all have issues. And we all need to kind of band together. This has to be more like a village uh, than anything, and we have to support each other. The thing that I like about joy, the word joy, we have used it as an acronym, um, just breathe, open up, you matter. And that helps, I think, if you think about um, not really trying to point the finger at anybody, not trying to make people feel bad about what they're doing. We've all gone through this. Everybody has gone through this pandemic together, and we're all getting used to what we have to do, and it's, all, uh, it's affected us all. So there is no stick. We should have no stigma with um, wanting to get help and wanting to know more about how to get help and what we should be doing for our kids. Let me ask you this. Let's assume they're grandparents. Let's assume they're aunts, uncles, good friends of the family. But they detect and notice what they perceive as a problem. Do you have any pointers for those folks? I do. And, and I see that it could be a really contentious conversation depending on how you approach it. Um, but I think the most important thing is to keep the conversation focused on your concern for the child and that you really care about them and maybe point out some things that you've noticed. Like, I guess if I were going to approach a family member about concern about a niece or a nephew, I would say, hey, I, you know, I just noticed over like the past couple of months or, you know, or so that my niece has been spending more time in your room. Have you noticed that? And I think starting with open-ended questions that express concern could start a conversation. And if you had a close relationship with, with the teenager or with the kiddo, you could start an open-ended conversation with them. Like, Hey, you know, I've noticed that you've been a little bit more grumpy. Is like is something going on? Um, I, I think if you're going to talk to kids, a, a good spot to do it is in the car. Um, unless of course you're concerned, they're going to try to jump out. Um, but because everyone is looking forward, you don't have to make eye contact, which can be hard for kids sometimes. And so um, it's time limited. And I think you can have some honest conversations, um, you know, just on the way to school, on the way to soccer practice. Um, so it could be a good time to ask hard questions. Our kids are our most important conversation. And this podcast, Raising Joy, will give you some insights on what they're dealing with right now that you may not have thought about. More from our team from Cook Children's on the podcast, Raising Joy, next on the human side of healthcare.
Welcome back to the human side of healthcare, where we explore how to take better care of your health so you can live a happier, healthier life. With DFW Hospital Council CEO Stephen Love, along with Thomas Miller. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with the two ladies who are hosting the new Raising Joy podcast brought to you by Cook Children's in Fort Worth. We're talking with Dr. Kristen Perch and Winnie King. And Winnie, I'd like to ask, when a hospital system starts a podcast, what is your greatest contribution to people? How is Raising Joy extending beyond your own walls into the community? I I think we want to give parents um, the idea that there is help, there is a way to to approach these difficult situations with your kids. Um, There is hope on the horizon. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of uh, tips that we can give them that will help them navigate this. Um, You know, I, I think a lot of times when Christian was speaking, it made me think about, as being a parent myself, when, when the child comes to me and has uh, an issue, the first thing I want to do is try to solve it. I want to offer up what we can do. Let's do this. Let's do this. And sometimes it's not about you trying to solve it. It's just you listening and you asking the child, is there anything I can do? And let them determine if you need to fix it rather than you jumping in and fixing it, because I've learned that the hard way. (laughs) So that's just parenting. That's parenting one on one that I've learned the hard way with my son. Um, Don't try to fix it. Just ask the question and let them determine if there's something you can do. But we want to be able to give parents hope. This is the whole and, and hope for their kids. This is the whole objective is to make sure that they understand that tomorrow can come and it's not as bad tomorrow as it was today. We just need to make sure that they have that hope, parents and kids. I agree. And I I think um, I hope that parents and teenagers, as Winnie said earlier, just realize that they're not alone and that there are so many people, unfortunately, struggling uh, with their mental health and watching their kids struggle. And it's just really hard. And so we hope that they they do have hope that help is on the way and um, and just realize that they're not alone. And there are professionals who really do want to help um, as best we can. Well, all I can say is congratulations to you. I think this is an excellent program, I think. Raising Joy is really a great name uh, that y'all are using. And, you know, I think as we look especially at uh, many of the issues that young people are facing and the unfortunate suicide attempts, what y'all are doing is really God's work. And really appreciate y'all doing that. And I am going to pause and see if Thomas has any questions. You know, it seems like adults are, for the most part, pretty much back to normal, if you will, from COVID-19. So if adults are kind of back to normal, families back to normal, are kids really back to normal? I would say that kids are not quite back to normal. Um, In terms of education, we know that, um, you know, they've taken an academic hit from, from doing virtual school, and I'm hopeful that over time that the schools will be given resources in order to help those kids catch up. As far as mentally, are they back to normal? I would say I don't think they're quite there yet. And part of it is if this isolation and loss of control and self-esteem has led to an episode of depression, your brain is going to focus on what's negative and what's not there. And so just as being depressed, right? So they may not see the good things that are happening and may be kind of focused on the negative. So I think things are slowly getting back to normal. And I think as kids experience normalcy, I think that things will improve slowly, but I think we're still a little bit off from that. What is your thought on this? People who lived through the depression, for example, became hoarders in many cases. Uh, For a lot of us, our parents or grandparents lived through the depression How do you think these kids will be marked by COVID-19 for the rest of their lives? I I think it's not just COVID. It's not just COVID. I mean, there are things we're dealing with or these kids are dealing with that even though, yes, we did go through the the Great Depression, some of our parents, but they're now going through 9-11. They've gone through the COVID. They've gone through the situation now with Ukraine, and they're seeing more and more. We've had, um, you know, upsets in the weather, and and, uh, these kids are dealing with back-to-back-to-back-to-back 
it seems like to me, the tragedies that, you know, are, are that they're looking at and they're seeing and they can't seem to escape from it. And I think part of it is, yes, COVID pulled the, the curtain back, but they have, there have been so many other incidents that they're having to deal with and overcome that um, it, it's going to be a tall order for them to jump over this. It's why we have to really think about their mental health because there's so many things that they were, that we're dealing with that they have to confront and they're having to, to see and they can't escape. I feel bad for them in that regard. And then of course, with social media, just like uh, Steve mentioned, it's 24 seven. So all of that is in their face all day, every day. When back in, you know, the, the days of depression, we, we didn't have that. We, we read newspapers, we saw three television stations and that was it, you know. Um, but now these kids have multiple areas and multiple ways of consuming information. And sometimes it, it navigates them to the negative. Um, that consumption of, of information on the internet, the algorithms bring them back to negative. So there's just so much that they have to overcome. Uh, and, and so COVID and the pandemic is not just the only thing that they have to, that they have to deal with. Wow. That was awesome. <laughs> that was a <laughs> that, great, that is true. Yeah. yeah what she said. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I have nothing to add. <laughs> yeah, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always good to leave on laughter. Thank you, Winnie King and Dr. Kristen Perch, for telling us about your new show, and we wish you the best. If you'd like to catch all of that interview, we have one, too. Of course, The Human Side of Healthcare. It's on all the podcast apps and on YouTube. Steve? You know, Thomas, what a great segment on behavior. And as we think in terms of behavior, there are actually some medical conditions that can affect our thinking and our clarity. And one of those is really going to surprise you. It sure is. We're going to be talking to urologist Dr. Casey Benz from Methodist Dallas Medical Center. She's going to tell us what this issue is, and we'll give you a hint. UTI. Do you know what that is, Dr. Benz? Sure. So a UTI is a urinary tract infection, like you said. Um, It is usually due to a buildup of bacteria in the urine, Um, And symptoms can be variable. Um, Most commonly, patients have some type of urinary symptom, whether that be blood in the urine, really foul-smelling urine, or an increase in leakage of urine or incontinence. Um, But when it comes to more elderly individuals, they can also often develop confusion um, or what's also called delirium. Some of the elderly people, as you mentioned, can develop delirium. Can you tell us the link, if you will, that you've seen between delirium and UTIs in seniors? Why is that? Well, so I think um, it's important to understand what delirium really is. So it's a very vague term um, or a term that encompasses any type of alteration in your mental status or confusion, um, and it can be caused by a lot of different things, usually some acute underlying medical issue. So either a worsening flare-up of a chronic illness like heart failure or diabetes. It can also be due to infection, um, and that's why we see it in patients that have urinary tract infections. But it's not just UTIs that can cause delirium. It's many other things and many other types of infections. And then certain medications can cause delirium. So there's a lot of things that can lead to it. Um, I think specifically in seniors, the reason that infections and UTIs commonly present with delirium is because their immune system is just not as robust as they once were their bodies are more sensitive and specifically their brains are more sensitive to stresses that come with infection. So how common would you say delirium is in elderly patients when they do get a UTI? Um, I would say more than 50%. Um, I don't know if that's 
a, a studied number, but I think it's very common um, and definitely much more common in older individuals. And again, that goes back to the sensitivity of their brain and the fact that they just don't have a robust immune response um, with fevers to fight infection um, like a younger person would. Is it possible that some of the patients or patients' families confuse delirium with dementia? Oh, yes, that is definitely possible, and I think that is a common point of confusion. So the difference is that dementia is usually very slow onset, so it happens over the course of several months to years, um, and it is due to an actual anatomic change in the brain and is a true disease of the brain. Um, and it's also most of the time not reversible. So as it progresses, it gets worse and you can't really improve it. Whereas delirium, like I've said, is really due to an acute underlying issue and it develops over the course of a couple days. It can also fluctuate at different times in the day and is reversible after treating the underlying cause. You know, that's interesting in your answer. You meant even the time of day can impact it. Does that mean that you see it more frequently at nighttime than daytime, or is it kind of across the board? It can be seen more frequently at night, and that is due to what's called sundowning um, in elderly individuals. Um, I'm actually not sure the exact <laughs> medical reason on why it's more common at night, other than the fact that I think it, it becomes dark, gets a little harder to see, and it may lead to just a slight increase in confusion in older individuals. This is Dr. Casey Benz, a urologist at Methodist Dallas Medical Center, stumping Steve and me for sure. We had no idea that a urinary tract infection and temporary confusion would ever be linked. This affects a lot of people, so we're going to talk about it more when we come back on the human side of healthcare. Covering the healthcare topics that matter most to North Texas. This is the Human Side of Healthcare with DFW Hospital Council CEO Stephen Love, along with Thomas Miller. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. K.C. Benz, a urologist at Methodist Dallas Medical Center, talking about this incredible connection between temporary confusion and a urinary tract infection, particularly in elderly people. Steve? Are there any specific red flags that can help people trace the cause of the delirium back to a UTI as opposed to dementia? So I think looking out for some of these other symptoms that can be associated with a urinary tract infection, like blood in the urine, increase in continence, foul-smelling urine, complaining of abdominal pain or back pain, you know, if you had those things coupled with confusion and delirium, I think it would lean more towards a UTI and can make that a little bit more evident. And then I think as far as delineating from dementia, like I said, it's really the time to onset of the symptoms and whether this is kind of an acute confusion versus a long, slow progression in confusion. You know, for your patients that present with urinary tract infection, what treatments are available for them? Treatment of a urinary infection would be primarily antibiotics um, in order to get rid of the bacteria that is growing in the urine. Um, other supportive treatments can be some IV fluids, pain medication, um, medication that can help with some of the symptoms of pain with urination. But really, the, the mainstay of treatment is going to be the antibiotics to really get rid of the infection um, and get a patient back to normal. You know, for a patient that goes through the treatment and takes the antibiotic, how soon, once they're treated, does the delirium improve? That is a little variable. Um, I would say that a lot of patients improve pretty rapidly. It kind of depends on the severity of the infection. Um, I think the more severe the infection, it may take a little bit longer for the delirium to resolve. You know, if patients have such a severe infection that they require a breathing tube or have infection in the blood and um, have really a severe illness, then 
um, that could definitely take longer. But once the antibiotics really start working and the infection is cleared, the delirium should resolve. You know, if our listeners, if they think uh, a family member is showing some symptoms of delirium, what should they do and what do you recommend they try to get the patient to do? I think just recognizing that your family member has some change in their mental status and is much more confused or not acting themselves is really important. And I think the older your family member is, you know, looking out for these kind of sometimes even subtle changes um, where they just say sentences that don't make sense um, is really important. So recognizing it is number one. And then number two, these patients should be evaluated probably in an, in an emergency room setting. You could call your primary care doctor, but more often than not, when it comes to altered mental status, um, they're going to refer you to an emergency room for evaluation because as I've stated, you know, it could be due to a whole lot of different things. Your patient definitely needs a workup of what's going on. So yeah, I think uh, seeking out medical care as soon as possible would be my recommendation. And, you know, in the meantime, trying to get, I know that trying to get a confused elderly individual, maybe in a car into an ER might be difficult, but uh, reassurance and redirection um, and explaining things can be very helpful. You know, Dr. Ben, as a urologist, I know we've asked you some questions about elderly. We've talked a little bit about delirium. But younger people, how common are UTIs in young people? Younger people do get UTIs. They don't always have these severe of symptoms, um, and particularly it's pretty uncommon for them to get delirium. Um, But a UTI can occur in younger people. It's definitely more common in women just because anatomically the urethra is much shorter than um, the urethra of a man. So, you know, I think it definitely happens, but most of the time it doesn't cause such severe symptoms that they need to be seen in an ER. It can often be handled by a primary care doctor and just given antibiotics, you know, orally as an outpatient for a few days or a week. You know, I know you're a physician and you probably shudder when you hear this, but I've heard growing up throughout my life, uh, hey, if you think you may have a kidney infection or a urinary infection, drink cranberry juice. Does diet have any impact on UTIs? So that is a great question. I think this is a common old wives tale, if you will. To answer it directly, if you get a urine infection or a kidney infection, drinking cranberry juice is not going to get rid of the bacteria. Sometimes it can help some of the symptoms of pain with urination, but the only thing that's going to actually rid the bacteria is an antibiotic. Now, some women who have recurring urinary infections, there is a slight amount of evidence that supports taking cranberry supplements every day and that that can sometimes reduce the number of UTIs a woman gets in any given year. Um, But that evidence is not very strong I would say it's minimally supported at best, but also cranberry supplements are not harmful. Um, And so if you are a woman that's having recurrent urinary infections, taking cranberry supplements may help you a little bit. And, you know, if it does, that's great. So regardless of your age, if you keep yourself hydrated, drink water frequently during the day, does that help in any way to prevent UTIs? Um. Not necessarily. You know, drinking water isn't really going to prevent you from getting an infection, again, because it's really the bacteria buildup. But it is important for overall kidney health to drink lots of fluid and keep your kidneys nice and hydrated. So, again, I'm not sure it's actually going to really prevent you from getting an infection, but it is a great idea and a great practice to do in your daily life to drink lots of water and keep yourself hydrated. You know, Dr. Benz, you've done a great job answering my questions. For our listeners out there, is there any final message you want to convey to them about overall UTIs regardless of age, any other thoughts on delirium or words of wisdom that will help them and their families? I think that um, 
you know, it's important to recognize the symptoms of a UTI, whether um, you are a younger individual or an older individual, um, and to understand that a acute change in your mental status and delirium is definitely something that needs to be evaluated and not ignored because it can be a symptom of some, you know, significant underlying problem. So I think that just making sure that um, patients who do de- develop delirium are evaluated and looking out for these other symptoms of urine infections are important. And, um, you know, if you're having urine infections and problems with recurring infections, regardless of your age, then um, you should you know, be sure to follow up with your primary care doctor and potentially see a urologist. Dr. Benz, this is Thomas. This is incredible. I never knew about this. Knew about UTIs, of course, but never that they were connected to the brain. So I always like to get underneath some of these uh, issues. So how does bacteria grow in our urine? I'm really curious to hear about the process. Well, that is a great question. Uh, There can be a lot of different reasons um, or different risk factors Things like having kidney stones or stones in the bladder, those are nidus for infection um, and can increase your risk of bacteria growth. If you're not emptying your bladder all the way, you basically have a backup of urine in the bladder or the kidneys where it's sitting there kind of stagnant essentially and makes it you know, a much more common place to develop bacteria. If you have in the large prostate, if you have a narrowing or scar tissue in the urethra, if you have any anatomic abnormalities of the genitourinary tract, all these things could make you more prone to um, a UTI. Dr. Casey Benz, a urologist at Methodist Dallas Medical Center. Thank you for this very valuable information. It's on our podcast, too, The Human Side of Healthcare, on all the podcast apps and YouTube. Steve? We've enjoyed having you with us today. Remember, wear that mask, wash those hands, and let's all stay well and have a great spring here in North Texas. Join us next week for The Human Side of Healthcare.